My name's Nicole, I'm part of the uh, Book World team at the Washington Post. First of, uh, first of all, a word of thanks to the co-chairman of the festival, David Rubenstein, and other generous sponsors who've made this event possible. If you'd like to add your financial support, please note the information in your program. After Kathleen Glasgow discusses her book, we'll have some time uh, for a question and answer session. So if you do want to ask her a question, just please come up to the microphone, and I've been told to remind you that this will be filmed, and if you're coming up, you should be okay with this being maybe potentially broadcast at a later date. So our guest this morning is Kathleen Glasgow, author of Girl in Pieces and How to Make Friends with the Dark. Her most recent novel is How to Make Friends with the Dark, and it's all about love, loss, and how to continue living when it feels like you've been surrounded by darkness. So please join me in welcoming Kathleen Glasgow. Can everyone hear me okay? okay? I'm going to adjust the stool for a minute. So thank you all for coming. Um, I always think that no one will show up, or maybe two people. And even if it's just two people, we have a pretty good time. But this is perfect, um, so thank you. And also, I want to thank the Library of Congress for inviting me back to the Nat National Book Festival. I was here in 2017, and I had a great time. So when I was here a few years ago talking about my first book for teens, uh, Girl in Pieces, has anyone read it? Well, if you haven't, it's a book about a girl named Charlie Davis who copes with the trauma in her life by self-harming. And if you aren't sure what that is, it's when a person burns or cuts themselves in order to feel better. And I know that it seems strange uh, that you might hurt yourself in order to feel better, but more than a million kids, mostly girls, do this every year, and I used to be one of them. And for a long time, I did not want to write that story. Um, I just wanted to go on wearing my long sleeves, working my office job, writing my poems because I was a poet. But one day, I met a girl on a bus in Minneapolis on my way to my office job, and she was maybe 15 or 16, and she had scars. And when she saw me looking at them, she turned away and got off at the next stop. And I thought about her for days, how I should have asked her how she was and how I should have said, you're not alone. Look at me. You are not alone. And I always turn to books when I feel especially alone or questioning or lonely. I find a story there. I find people. I find a place. I feel safe in books, in the fictional world, in a way that I don't always feel safe in real life. And I wanted to help that girl feel that way. So I ended up writing a 400-page letter to a scarred girl on a bus, and that letter became the book Girl in Pieces. And I tried to make a story that scarred kids, scared kids, sad kids, beautiful and broken, and hopeful kids could find a home in and know they weren't alone. And people always ask me if my books are autobiographical, and the answer is yes and no. For Girl in Pieces, I gave Charlie my scars, but her story is her own. And while I was writing that letter to the girl on the bus that became the book Girl in Pieces, my mother died. How many people here have lost someone? And it sucks, right? It, like, it sucks so bad. And you can read all the books you want and all the advice you want. And there's still, as Tiger says in my book, How to Make Friends with the Dark, there's still like this giant Grand Canyon-sized hole inside your body. And here I was, because I'd lost my sister a few years before I lost my mother. There I was, the last Glasgow girl standing. And I tell you, I was hollowed out. I was sucked out. I was a walking piece of pain. And all the nice, kind people around me said, this will pass, or this will heal. And they said it so much, I just really wanted to punch them. <laughs> because, you know, when we talk about grief, we talk about healing and niceness and letting go and acceptance. And I wasn't really ready to accept that I was going to walk around with that giant Grand Canyon of 
pain in my heart. I just really wanted to, I was just mad. I was mad. And I felt like it doesn't heal. It doesn't get better. It's a giant hole in your body that's heavier than anything you've ever known. And you have to figure out how to carry that thing around for the rest of your life. So I wrote a book about it, about a girl named Tiger whose mother dies suddenly and she's got no one. Her father's in prison, she's never known him. She has a couple of friends, but her mother has always kept her very close to her and at home and very protective of her for her own reasons. She spends time in foster care before a half-sister that she never knew she had comes to take care of her. And that sister is only 20 and doesn't really know how to take care of herself, much less a grieving 16-year-old girl. So it's a book very much about what it means to be a parent as opposed to what it means to parent someone. And in the end of the book, Shana, after figuring out what she needs to do, literally turns to books like Parenting for Dummies, which exists, I looked it up, and takes a lot of her parenting advice from Tammy Taylor from Friday Night Lights, who's watched that show. I thought she was a great mom. I think of that show a lot of time when I'm parenting my own kids, like, what would Tammy Taylor say? <laughs> so Tiger has to figure out how to be in the world without a mother, much like I did. She has to figure out how to live with grief, much like I did, and do every day. And this was not a pleasant book to write. Writing is a joyous, magical, and painful thing, sometimes all at once, and sometimes separately. And it was a really, really hard book to write. And when I had finished the first draft, and I sent it to my editor, she said, oh, I really like this, this is great. You know, you've really like plumbed the depths of grief. And I think that teens and adults are really gonna connect with this. And I was like, okay. But I had Girl in Pieces out as well. And I was getting all this feedback that was great. Like, thank you for telling my story. I have scars. Thank you for saying this, I'm lonely. And then there was other feedback where maybe this book was too dark and teens shouldn't be reading Girl in Pieces because it was too depressing and it would keep them depressed. And for me as a writer, I'd never had public feedback like that before that was so immediate. And so I started thinking, well, maybe I should rewrite this book and I should make it kind of like lighter and funnier so it's not so dark and not so depressing. So I rewrote the entire book in a different voice with a different plot, and I sent it to my editor, and she called me on the phone, and she said, what did you do? <laughs> and I said, well, everybody says that Girl in Pieces is so sad, and you know, I, I, wanna, I don't wanna make everyone sad all the time, and so she's like, no, put it back. Put it all back. That's what you do, that's why I love you. Put it back. She also made me drop the book boyfriend that I had in How to Make Friends with the Dark because she said, he does not belong here. This girl, she does not need to fall in love to feel better. That goes, get that out. So I'm, goodbye Mason McNally. You'll show up somewhere in a book someday. <laughs> so I had to figure out how to put it all back, but start over and figure out how I was really gonna write this book for especially young people. And so one day, I posted a question on Facebook, and I said, if you had a chance to say just one more thing to someone who had died, what would it be? And lots of people said, you know, nice things like, I would say I love you and I miss you, or I just want you to know I'm happy. And some people messaged me privately because the things they had to say were not very nice because some people don't have good memories of their dead. And that's okay too. Like sometimes people die and we're relieved. Sometimes people die and they were abusive in real life. And we have to respect that for the people who say, no, I'm glad. We have to respect their moments of grief. And one person, a very lovely writer named Susan said, my mother died when I was 10 and no one wanted to talk about her. I would ask her to write me a letter telling me how I should live without her because I'm 64 years old now and I still don't know how. And I was like, oh my gosh, 
you see? I'm like, oh my God. And so I decided to kind of think of how to make friends with the dark as another letter. A letter on how to live without your parent or your sibling, things you should know, little things and big things, like how much death certificates cost, how you have to prove to credit card companies that that person has died and they want to see the death certificate and so you have to pay for another one and send it, what ashes really look like when you finally get them in a bag, how much coffins cost if you choose to go that route, or how one day you're in Target having a great time and you're buying toothpaste and trash bags and ice cream and somewhere in the middle of deciding between salted caramel and mint chocolate chip, you remember how much your mother loved Rocky Road and suddenly you're a sobbing mess because that's death. And I found out that that moment, those moments that you have sometimes where you're going about your day and everything is okay and suddenly something reminds you, right? We're both like, ah, of your person that you're like, woo, and you're down. You're down for the count. That's called a stug, S-T-U-G, and it's a, a sudden, temporary upsurge in grief. So if you guys have ever had stugs, you're in the stug club with me. Now you know what that moment is called. And right about now, you can see that some people are probably like, good Lord, does this woman ever write about anything happy? <laughs> and it's like, yes and no, not really. Maybe. I do write dark books. I write about mental illness and death and self-harm and depression and feeling lost and alone even when you're surrounded by people. Because those are things that happen in real life and they happen to kids quite often. And kids need books to process things that are happening to them. They need stories that reflect their lived experiences. They need stories to find courage, to open up, to find possibility, and to find hope. I have a lot of hope. And to not make these stories available to kids is to not deny that things like death and depression and self-harm exist. And if we do that, we fail those kids who need those stories the most because we erase them from life. We pretend that those kids don't exist. I'm gonna finish by reading a little bit of How to Make Friends with the Dark. And this is the last passage after Tiger has left Sierra Vista and moved to Tucson and is attending a grief group made mostly of adults. And in the passage, she references a video of her mother that she found on a cell phone a few months after her mother had died. But if you want to know more about that, you have to read the book. And that was when I wrote that part of the book where she finds that video, which is sort of a last message of her mother. That was my way of helping Tiger heal in a small way. Because one thing that Tiger wonders in the book is, will my mother come to me ever in a dream? Will I ever see her? Will I ever hear her again? Because some people do get messages from people who are gone. And that was my way of giving her a little bit of, of hope in that area. Checking my time. Let's see. Okay. One night in group, we talk about what I was wondering about way back at the beginning of the summer. If you're dead, come to you. That. Phil is in his 30s. His face is gutted from teenage acne, and he wears a black leather vest bearing the sign of his motorcycle club. His forearms are a testament to ink and time spent in jail. But he cries when he tells us about spooning vanilla ice cream into his mother's mouth just before she died because she wanted to taste sweetness one last time. Her cancer made eating incredibly painful and nearly impossible at the end. Phil says, a few months later, she showed up in my dream. She was sitting on the couch in her old living room, her feet up, 
and her circulation stockings on, watching Dallas. And she said, oh, Philip, sit down. Look what I have. I can have all I want now. And she had the biggest barrel of vanilla ice cream in front of her and a giant spoon, like in a cartoon. And I knew she was all right. And I didn't even have anything to drink that night. And there she was. And we, watched, we had ice cream and watched JR. And when I woke up, I cried. I could taste the vanilla ice cream. I really could. One by one, the others weigh in. A woman named Trisha, who'd lost both her mother and her sister within a few years of each other, says her mother showed up in a dream the very night after she died. She'd been in a wheelchair for a long time, and we were in a room somewhere. It was very bright, and she didn't have the chair. She was walking. She hadn't walked in years, and there she was, up and about. And I remember she said, I'm going to go look for your sister now, and she walked out of the room. Trisha pauses and looks at all of us, her eyes wet. That made me feel better, thinking they would be together and that my mother could walk again if she felt like it. I still haven't seen my mother, except for that brief moment on her cell phone, and part of me hopes it's because she's busy with people she hasn't seen in a long time, like her parents, or because she thinks I'm okay and I don't need her, or maybe she's worried she'll frighten me. I don't know, but I still hope, every night, regardless. I think I'll tell my group about the cell phone thing sometime. I know they would believe me. And I do find it comforting that maybe when you die, you get back all the things you've ever lost, like your legs, or your parents, or your daughters, or even your mom. And you get to eat all the ice cream you want, finally, and it doesn't hurt one bit. And the dream that Trisha has where her mother is up and walking and goes to live with her sister was a dream that I had three nights after my mother died and she had been in a wheelchair. And that was the dream I had and I put it in the book. So I believe, I believe that we can live with grief. I believe that we can carry this grand, I'm sorry, you're going to make me cry. <laughs> I believe we can walk around with this grand canyon of grief inside us we can make it. Every day that we're still standing here is a testament to the people that we've lost and to our strength, and that grief is our shared human experience. And so I write those books. I put it in there because I believe no matter what you're feeling right now, if you feel lost and lonely and you don't know how to talk about it, you can find it in a book. So thank you for coming. And I'm happy to take any questions. I'll talk about anything. Thank you. Hi, Hello. thank you. Hello, hi. I'm missionary range, so I am actually a trained missionary. And oh. I appreciate um, your work. I am the author of the work, All Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter and Blue Lives Matter. It's from the same sermon. Uh -huh. And I want it to be clear that All Lives Matter and Black Lives Matter works together. And um, because you speak so of death, it really has to be clear that we celebrate life while we have life. Yes. And there's so many who, um, when they get to a hard place in life, and they think about problem solving. They think of guns and violence and uh, all sorts of things that hurt, but there is a wait time that would actually be a better way. And you're speaking of it when you speak of conversations. Of course, as a woman of God, I think that conversation would be prayer. Yes. Um, yet I call it wait time. Take the time out and hear and feel and understand that there is a place of peace that you can get to if you wait for it. And I believe you've gotten to that place with uh, the situations in your life. And I just would ask that you would uh, share some on what I call wait time. It's what teachers you know, give for mm -hmm. students to have an opportunity to share. But uh, if you would uh, speak on that, wait time, prayer, or a time of peace 
or settling oneself before they act rashly. Well, in the book, Tiger, she hasn't reached that, that place of peace yet. And in the book, she lashes out physically with students at school um, who are not very nice to her because she doesn't, she doesn't, she doesn't know what her response should be. Um, you know, as adults, if we lose someone, we know, okay, I, I could read this book or I could take this class or I could go to a grief support group. Like, we have tools. Teens don't really have those tools because we're supposed to be teaching them. And a lot of the book is about, I've lost the person who's supposed to be teaching me. And in the book, Tiger says, my mother's dead and my mother isn't here to help me with the fact that my mother is dead because a mother would help you with that. Um, so she has to learn how to do that. She joins a grief support group at school and she finds other kids that she didn't know who've lost like sisters and brothers and parents and that helps her tremendously. And for me personally, I still haven't reached that moment of peace I might gradually be coming towards that, but I like to think of my grief as a mountain, and I can't walk around it because it's too big, and I can't walk up it because I might fall down. So I'm just leaning against it, and I'm accepting it, and I'm taking it, that giant mountain of weight. I'm just leaning against it at this moment. I don't know if that answers your question, but I'm getting there. But I do have another question over there, too. Thank you, I appreciate it. And I call that uh, divine intervention time. As you lean, I believe that God uh, comes in and finds ways for you to cope as well as uh, heal. God Thank bless you. Thank you so much. Um, hi, um, I'm a high school student. I'm going into my senior year. And when Girl in Pieces came out, I had just gone through a really depressive episode. I had just like recovered from it. I was struggling with self-harm and I was about this close to killing myself and um, reading Girl in Pieces, it really helped me know that I'm not alone and that there are other people that um, share my story and everything. So I wanted to ask um, if Girl in Pieces had been written when you were struggling, how would it have helped you? First, I want to say I am awed and honored by your bravery to stand up in front of a room full of people and say that. That shows me like how strong you are and I'm so glad that you're standing there today just like I'm standing here. Um, at the point where I decided to write Girl in Pieces, I didn't want to talk. I had not harmed in several years. I've been harm free now for 25 years. And part of the thing, part of what helped me was continually writing and writing things down. Um, but I want to I wanna say to you, too, that you can do this and that whatever scars you have, inside or out, wear them proudly. You earned them. You felt them. You made them. You exist. They're there. You allowed yourself to feel so completely that you did this. And I am, I am proud of you. And a lot of times I like to tell people, we're a nation of women with scars. You need to see us. We need to be talking about it. We need to be talking about brave girls like this, who feel as though no one's listening to them, who feel alone, who have scars inside and out and who need our help to support them and we shouldn't be breaking them down or ignoring them or making them feel small or that they're being overly dramatic because they're not. They're brave and beautiful and there's one right now. So, Thank you. I'm really proud of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I got, I got up before to speak too. I teach eighth grade readers uh -huh. and um, I thanked Renee and I thanked Ellen and now I'm going to thank you um, because of young ladies like that. Mm -hmm. um, I, don't, I say I didn't, I didn't thrive in eighth grade, I survived eighth grade. Same thing here, <laughs> same thing. And um, I wanted to thank you and ask you 
So I want to thank you for saying what you said about feeding kids books where they don't feel alone. So I have Girl in Pieces in my classroom library, yeah. and I have this. I've never gotten to read. I haven't gotten to read it yet because it's never in. <laughs> and I just need to buy more copies, so that's what I'll do today. But um, the kids need yeah. your books, and they need books like Watch Us Rise, and they need, they need to see they will be okay. Yes. And there are so many teachers who are not understanding that and are going more on the side of banning or censoring yeah. because they don't want to trigger kids. And our kids need to see they're okay, yes. and they will be okay. So thank you for that message. And it's not really a question, but please keep writing. Do you have another book coming out soon? I know this one is relatively new, and I'm just pushing you a little. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you for teaching our kids, and I want to applaud you because your job is one of the most important ones that we have. Um, teachers raise our kids. You know, we go to work. They're with them more than we are you know, eight hours a day and sometimes longer. So thank you so much. Um, there are teachers that ban or censor books because they don't want to upset kids. And like I said, kids, they're living through this, you know? Suicide is the number one cause of death for teenagers. If you ban a book that talks about suicide, they can't talk about it, they can't process it. They're losing their friends, maybe they tried it. They need to have a safe, split, safe space inside books to explore things that they need to talk about and work through. And a book is a safe place for that because no one's bothering you, you can read it, you have your own thoughts, and it's really important that you make all sorts of books available to all kids. Kids don't come in one size. They're not all happy, they're not all perfect, they're not all straight-A students, they have different home lives that you might not know anything about, and those things need to be reflected so that they can read them. If you keep children from reading books, like I said, you erase them. You yes. say that what happens to them doesn't matter because they don't matter. So thank you so much for being so attentive to your students. Thank you for providing the materials for us to feed them because thank you're you. providing the materials they need. Thank you so, so much. Yeah. Uh, so unlike the other two, I don't really have like a really touching story or anything. I'm just curious, like, <laughs> it's okay. um, like in the writing process, mm -hmm. what, what is the most important aspect of it to you? What do you value the most when you write? Like when I'm writing the story? When you set out to write a story. The thing that I value most when I'm setting out to write the story is that I want to be as honest about the story as possible. Um, when I was writing Girl in Pieces, I didn't have anyone looking over my shoulder. I never expected it to be published. Um, the first draft was very different. It took 13 drafts and nine years to write that book because I had two kids during the meantime. My sister died by suicide. My mother died. I took time off to write. Uh, I took time off from writing for that. Um, and after my mother died, the next draft of Girl in Pieces that I wrote is the one that broke open that story for me. And I realized I had to be completely honest about what self-harm is, how it happens, and why one girl does it, and that I wasn't going to hold back from describing that because I hadn't seen that in a book before. And I was going to tell people exactly how it felt being that girl. So I feel like for me, um, the value in the writing process is being as honest and open about as possible about what that story is so that readers can find themselves in that story. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I like your ears. Thank you. Um, I'm a social worker and um, a, I do see a lot of uh, adults as well as adolescents and, and young adults. Um, and one of the greatest frustrations I have is that people are coming to me and talking about their own pain as if they're the only one who can experience it and the only one who um, feels that deeply. Right. And um, so I, I really just appreciate, this is more of a comment, I just appreciate um, you 
being so honest and open in your books and letting people know that they're not alone. Um, and I agree that the more people are talking to each other about how they're feeling and allowing themselves to be vulnerable, right. then they'll also see how much love they have yeah. and how much they are loved. Thank you so much for all the work that you do as well. You're really, you're helping people and I admire that um, so much. And we, we just really don't, we don't encourage people, especially kids, to open up about the things that they're going through and the pain that they're feeling, which is why they feel alone. And I, part of that's like our can-do American attitude, like you can get past this, you can do this. And I think part of it is that people like to say that kids are resilient. I don't think they are. They don't know how to be resilient yet. They don't have the tools. They're not. So Their brains are not developed for that. <laughs> they're not. So, you, you know, it can't be a question of like, you'll feel better tomorrow, you'll bounce back. And it's, that is just, it's not true. We need to be protecting our children and not expecting them to be mini adults with all the tools in their toolkit to survive because that's just not true. So... Um, so you mentioned one of your intentions as an author mm -hmm. was to give a place for people to find themselves. Yes. Um, I write on a much smaller, much, much smaller scale with a much smaller platform, but I know the dilemma of writing with a specific intention, um, but the inadvertent effect of having a, an opposite effect. Yeah. Um, with your writing. So I'm just curious, writer to writer, how do you process that when you're writing about such significant, tricky um, topics and targeting a very vulnerable audience? Mm -hmm. How do you process through the inadvertent, potentially negative effects that your writing can have? That it may trigger some yeah. people? Well, when I'm writing, I don't know what might trigger someone because we all, we all feel differently. We all have different triggers. There's no way to write a book about self-harm without it triggering somebody. But I did it in the most honest way that I could. And coming from a background of self-harm, I feel like I handled it very carefully and I showed the reality of it, both the reality of what happens but also what happens when you learn how to cope with it and when you learn how to take care of yourself as a person and how you learn how to be in the world as a person who feels that way. Sometimes people write to me and they say, I don't know if I can read your book yet. And I say, you know what? You don't ever have to. If you're reading a book and it upsets you, put it away. You're not ready for that book or that book isn't for you. And it's the same way with kids. You know, they won't read a book they don't want to read. And if they read a book that's upsetting to them, they will put it away and they will go to a different book. You have to trust them. They're really good at that. They know what they like and what they need and what they don't. You just have to let them have the opportunity to choose for themselves. So for me, when people ask me that question, like, were you worried about upsetting people? Yes and no, but also, if you think a book is upsetting, don't read it. The cover, particularly for Girl in Pieces, it's the text of the book, and then it has red lines through the title. And that's kind of a signal yeah. for people who are looking for a book about someone who self-harms. They know that book is for them. Yeah. And if they want to read it, they can. And if they feel weird looking at the cover, they don't have to buy it. I do get at least four or five emails every week from older women who look at the cover but don't read the back, and they say, you know, I thought this was going to be a book about a girl who was murdered. I thought it was going to be a mystery, girl in pieces, and it wasn't. I mean, I liked it, but it was sad, but that wasn't what I wanted. And I'm like, turn it over and read the back. Also, you know, about that, this is one of the great things about Goodreads. Who goes to Goodreads? If you're worried about a book and you want to know some of the content, Goodreads is the place to go because people on there will talk about that book. And you can say, maybe I'm not ready to read that now, or that's not for me. And so, you know, good on Goodreads for that. Yeah. My son is actually um, a very prolific um, 
reviewer. I love and, the reviewers on Goodreads. And um, Tucker the Reader. And he always does do trigger warnings. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So people will, they will do that for you. And some authors put those in their books. But I feel like the Goodreads reviewers do a great job of like sussing a book out for you. And that's a great question. Thank you. Anything? Oh, he's giving me the wrap it up sign. So I'll be signing in an hour if you want to come by and say hi to me. And I have bracelets. And thank you so much for coming to this talk. You have made my day. Thank you.